Those minor prophet texts can be hard to read out loud sometimes. It's one of those reminders of how we might sometimes feel disconnected by this history in the Old Testament, maybe even by these stories. And we, when we hear them read out loud, we may wonder, how is it that our world, how is it that we, God's people, continue to fit within these texts, but maybe even more importantly, within these stories? Haggai is one of those, uh, what's often referred to as post-exilic document. Now, if you ever wanna really impress someone or maybe even confuse them in a Sunday school class or in a Bible study, especially if you're talking about Old Testament, just throw in the phrase post-exilic document and people will just kind of nod their heads uh, in contemplation, but really probably thinking, what are they talking about? Post-exilic document is a phrase that I used a lot in seminary when I didn't know a better answer, and it's really a great way just to kind of fill in that airtime if you're really not sure what's going on. And sometimes we have to confess that when we're reading these stories, we may not exactly know how it is that our story connects with this, or how do we see ourselves in this. But as we are exploring the story of Haggai, the prophet, and also seeing how it is that God is still with us, we're actually able to see that many of our concerns and joys and uncertainties and worries are also connected with the people of this story. And so as I said, Haggai is one of these post-exilic prophets. Now, when we say post-exilic, we're talking about people who are coming back to their home after the great exile in Babylon. And so this is one of the prophets who arose in Judah after the Persian Empire was able to defeat the Babylonian Empire and Persia allowed the Israelites to come back into their homes. And so, of course, as they are coming back, they are focusing on how it is that they are now going to rebuild their lives. And of course, for the Israelite people, a large part of rebuilding their own lives is rebuilding the Holy Temple. And we can probably imagine that it is not easy just as easy as rolling up their sleeves and getting to work. This was not just about a physical rebuilding. There was much, much more going on. Rebuilding the temple came with a lot of baggage. Now, just as putting aside the logistics and the physical labor of what it would take to go into an adventure like this, the deeper part was also just admitting that this temple had been destroyed, that their homes had been destroyed, that a huge part of their life, their spiritual life, in fact, they felt it had been destroyed. So just think about those instances, those life experiences of coming back to something, something that maybe if you had survived, you had been away from for a long time and you came back and it suddenly felt different. Maybe this story is not as disconnected to our own as we might think. So did these people build a totally new way to forget the past? Or did they want to build in a way that they could reclaim it? Is either scenario really all that healthy? And maybe did they need to find a third option? Haggai proclaims, who is left among you that saw this house in its former glory? How does it look to you now? What do we do when we don't remember the past or maybe we weren't even there for it? Remember in the book of Jeremiah when the Israelites are exiled to Babylon and God tells the people, plant crops, build tents, start families because you will be here for a long time. Children are born into families who return back to their homeland only these children have never been here before. And so they don't have the same connection as maybe someone who was able to survive this entire time could go back and be able to see. Almost two years ago, I went to Northern Ireland with Bishop Carter and several other United Methodist clergy to study firsthand some of the impacts that individuals and families were still processing after the Troubles which were conflicts that took place in Northern Ireland on the sides of Irish nationalists and British unionists 30 to 40 years ago, and how they are all now still living in the same communities. Going to Belfast, we saw murals of violence, of destruction, of lives lost. We saw names upon names upon names of people who had been killed in the conflict. We saw neighborhoods of Catholics and Protestants who still 
lived in homes right next to each other, but were still literally fenced off, gated off from one another. And as we looked at these murals, we would also talk to folks who might be passing by and asking, what do these artworks mean to them? And typically, when we asked children or teens or young adults, they would tell us that they didn't really know. And of course, what struck us was not so much that they didn't have the educated past and history as those who may have lived through it, but also at some point, they did not really see this as their story. How do we often wish for the past, especially now? How do we consider the past a part of our own current story? And what about those around us who do not feel as connected to that past? Or maybe they don't feel connected at all. What about those who do not want to go back to the past? In a couple of teams I am on with the Bishop's Anti-Racism Task Force, one of the things that I have heard over and over again by colleagues of color is, we do not want to go back to the past. The past was not good. In times of stress, our default can be to go back to what we knew or what we thought we knew. Or at the very least, this picture that we have in our minds that is so often painted by the airbrushes of nostalgia. Back in the Israelites' land, after decades in Babylon, the people were trying hard to bring back their presumed glory of what it meant to live in this pre-exilic world. But of course, nothing had gone as expected with the restoration work. It's almost always an exhausting task trying to create out loud in reality this thing, this picture, this image that we may have in our imaginations. And many times, no matter how many times or how often we try to pound that square peg, it just will not fit in that round hole. Maybe we cannot recreate the past because it is not ours to recreate. Because we can't go backward, we can only move forward. And at any rate, what if this is not really about building a physical temple? Now, maybe for us, as we are reading outside this story, it may seem clear and simple to us. Well, of course, it's not about building a physical temple. But what about us in our context, in our lives today? What for us is our physical temple? I'm often reminded of this part of the story in the Gospel of Mark. I think it's in chapter 13 when the disciples are walking with Jesus outside the temple and one of them says, oh, look at these stone walls. Look how tall and how beautiful they are. And I imagine that this is, you know, just an ordinary, maybe a nice day, maybe pleasant. They've just come out of worship and they're admiring the beauty of the structure. And Jesus says, you know, not one of these stones will be left here. In fact, all of them will be destroyed and turned down. And I imagine the disciples, you know, they just kind of lose their buzz and thinking, wow, what, what a way to just depress us. But of course, Jesus is trying to remind us how much faith and attention and time and investment are we putting into physical things. A few years ago, my brother-in-law was married in Hawaii and I was able to officiate his wedding. One of the things that we were able to do together as a family is actually take a boat out to Mount Kilauea in the time that it was erupting. Now, it was probably not the smartest idea in hindsight, but it was an incredible experience. While we were on the boat, the captain was telling us that in the short amount of time that the volcano was erupting, he was able to take dozens and dozens of people out to this magnificent sighting. In fact, it was so powerful, he was telling us that retired Navy admirals who had stern stomachs their entire career were puking off of the side of the boat in the midst of what was happening. And I understood by the time we actually got there, the boat ride to the mountain was just fine. It was smooth. But as we got there, the the heat and the force of the pressure was so enormous that it was causing our boat to bob up and down in the waves. Pretty much all of us got sick that day. And maybe that was part of the experience because as I was standing on this boat, as I was looking at this incredible amount of steam and lava pouring out into the water, you could touch one side of the boat and the water was cold. And right on the next side, 
it was boiling. All of this stuff was happening at once. It was, it was so disjointed. And at the time, I found myself thinking about this incredible, powerful combination of both creation and destruction happening at the same time, wondering if maybe this was like what had happened in Genesis. And then in the midst of that, wondering, should I even be witnessing such an awesome sight as this? Destruction, construction, all happening in the midst of this incredible power, reminding me that nothing physical lasts forever. As intense as it was, looking back, it was a reminder of God's presence. God's presence in the midst of this at what times may seem like chaos and destruction, but also at the time, creation. And it reminded me that God still with us is always better than thinking God was with us. Once again, Haggai professes, in a little while I will shake the heavens and the earth and the sea and the dry land. And I will shake all the nations so that the treasure of all nations shall come. And I will fill this house with splendor, says the Lord of hosts. The silver is mine and the gold is mine. The latter splendor of this house shall be greater than the former, and in this place I will give prosperity, says the Lord of hosts. Where are we seeing this splendor today? Where are we seeing God today? And is it only in these physical spaces? Sometimes we can focus so powerfully that we do not notice how it is that God is speaking right next to us. I'm sure many of us know that famous fabled story of the person who receives a vision from God saying, I'm going to come to your house tonight. Make sure everything is ready. We will celebrate together. And the person awakes from this vision so excited and joyful. They spend all day cleaning their house, buying bags and bags of groceries, making sure that they make the best meal that they possibly can. The table's all set, and as the person is lighting their candle, the doorbell rings, and they think that it's God come to visit, and they open the door, and it's someone who is in need of food. And the person says, well, I do have all of this food here. There's only two of us, so I suppose I can wrap you up a little something. And then a few minutes later, another person comes wanting to know if they can have something to wear because it's so cold. And the person thinks, well, all I really have is this tablecloth. It's kind of thick. I mean, I was saving it for this meal, but I suppose you can have it. A third person comes and says, I just need someone to talk to. And the host thinks, well, God's going to show up any minute, but I suppose I could spare a few minutes before God arrives. And as the visitor leaves, the person is still waiting, and finally God shows up, and, and the person says, where have you been this whole time? I had everything ready. I had all this food. I put on my best tablecloth. All these people kept showing up, and now I have nothing to show for it. Where were you? And of course, God responds, I was always here. Have we lost our church in these 10 months? Think about it. It has been 10 months. Where is our church? And of course, the answer is with you, with us, with God still with us. The church is in your prayers, your presence, your gifts, your service, your witness, that in everything God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. So ask the people who have received food every second month that our Mission Depot has been open. Ask those who have received the grocery boxes that have been filled every month. Ask the children in our community who have received new clothes. Ask the children who are part of the United Methodist Florida Children's Home, who is literally experienced love and grace by churches all over Florida. Do they just have one church? Ask those who have been receiving phone calls, those who have been receiving gift 
uh, greeting cards, those who are still being contacted in the hospital, those who have been comforted in times of loss and grief and mourning. Where has the church been for them? It is not just about a physical temple. It is about you, it is about us, reminding each other God is still with us. During this pandemic, we have been given a unique opportunity to see how powerfully, in the midst of everything changing, that not only does the church still live, but it thrives. It continues. It continues doing and being the very thing it was created for. When the people of Haggai's time and before wanted to show God's presence, they would plant stones in that spot called Ebenezer's. This is where we get that famous line from the hymn, here I raise mine Ebenezer. If God appeared, someone would place a stone so that any passerby would know that God was there. What Jesus teaches his people, and of course what he teaches us, was that it can be much more than just a simple stone to symbolize God's presence. More importantly, it is a transformed life. It is when we, in the midst of what it is that God is doing, shares that love and grace with others so that their lives too can be changed. We, you and I, we are the stones. We are the Ebenezer's. God is not only with us in a temple, God is with us in life. And not only in memory, but also in present. So will we fill our time with wanting the past? Or will we be God's temple, God's church today, here and now, in the present? Do we want the church? Maybe we should simply focus on being the church. Let us pray together. Holy and gracious God, we confess at times, and particularly in this season of uncertainty, of frustration, of feeling so overwhelmed, that we just simply need those physical, tangible, present symbols to remind us that things are still moving forward. We confess that at times in our stress, we may just simply want to go back to what we think was best, to a time when things were glorious, things were powerful, when we were strong, so that we don't have to focus on our weakness now. But, oh, gracious God, help us to remember. Help us to experience your love, your guidance, your assurance, your comfort, but also your pull towards the present and the future that we do not simply just wish for things as they were, but we live into how things are. And yet as well, how things could be. And so may we, as you have gifted, enabled us, may we continue to give of ourselves, our prayers, our presence, our gifts, our service, and our witness, that in everything you may be glorified in Jesus Christ. May we remember and share that you are still with us. Amen.